Let's break down the actual medicine and biology behind rabies. Rabies is a disease and it's caused by a specific virus called the rabies lysivirus. The reason this infection is so famous is because it has the highest case fatality rate of any human infectious disease. Now this term refers to the proportion of people that die from a certain disease. Just to give you a bit of context, the 1918 Spanish flu had a case fatality rate of about 2.5%. Untreated bubonic plague sits about 60%. And Ebola virus is as high as 90%. For unvaccinated individuals, rabies will kill 99% of people. To understand why this is, let's learn about its virology. Now, it's a part of the Rhabdoviridae family. Rhabdo means rod, referring to its bullet shape of the pathogen. Within this family, it's a part of the genus Lysivirus. Now, Lyssa in Greek mythology was the personification of mad rage. Now that's quite telling of the disease's clinical features. Rabies is a zoonotic infection that occurs in mammals, usually transmitted to humans by the bite of an infected host, most likely a dog. Now let's track the virus during its pathogenesis, which has five main steps. First, inoculation. A patient is bitten and inoculated with the virus. Its incubation period is about 50 days. Second, the virus, which is now in the muscle, makes its way to the neuromuscular junction, where it binds to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Third, it then travels up the axon of the motor neuron and replicates. Fourth, the virus continues to spread up to the central nervous system to the brain, where it rapidly disseminates. Finally, the rabies virus exits the CNS. Now, it does this through motor, sensory, and autonomic nerves, and by locally replicating in salivary and lacrimal glands in order to be transmitted to the next host. The actual clinical features of rabies always begins with a prodrome of non-specific manifestations. These include fever, malaise, and headache. The earliest specific neurological features include paresthesia and pruritus around the site of exposure, even though the wound is often just healed by this time anyway. After the prodrome, there are two major forms of the disease that might ensue. Encephalitic rabies or paralytic rabies. Now, encephalitic rabies is more common at about 80%. It's also known as furious rabies because of its mad features. M is my mnemonic that stands for mental state changes. Hallucinations and combativeness is common, along with episodes of wild excitability, typically followed by periods of complete lucidity. A stands for autonomic dysfunction. Hypersalivation is the most notable feature. Another curious phenomenon is hydrophobia. This involves involuntary, painful contractions of the diaphragm and pharyngeal muscles in response to swallowing liquids. Now, we usually inhibit these strong reflexes that act to protect the respiratory tract in the event of choking. But when inhibition is lost due to CNS damage, it results in an exaggerated defense response, even when a patient isn't choking. Our MAD acronym rapidly comes to an end with D for death once this virus starts causing dysfunction in our brainstem. On the other hand, paralytic rabies only occurs in 20% of patients, and the actual cardinal features of classic encephalitic rabies are missing, and this is because they have an early flaccid paralysis, often beginning around the area of the bite. In terms of investigations, most routine tests come back normal other than the diagnostic investigations. Our main options for diagnosis are rabies virus specific antibodies, but only in a previously unimmunized patient. Alternatively, we can detect rabies virus RNA via RT PCR in fresh saliva samples or in skin biopsy specimens. For its management, I just want you to think about post exposure prophylaxis. Since there's no effective therapy for rabies, it's important to just prevent the disease after an animal bite in the first place. This actually just involves three things. First, local wound care like cleaning and debridement. 
active immunization in the form of two purified inactivated rabies vaccines that are available. Finally, passive immunization in the form of rabies immunoglobulin, also known as RIG. Keep in mind that prophylaxis isn't always required. If you get bitten by an animal, but rabies is not present in the area, you don't need prophylaxis. If it is, and the animal was not captured, you should get prophylaxis. If the animal is caught, and it's behaving normally like a dog or a cat otherwise would, you can observe it for 10 days. But if it's another animal, like a bat, you do require the prophylaxis. If the animal doesn't show any signs of illness in this period, you don't need the prophylaxis either. Otherwise, or if you're unsure, the animal just needs to be sent for examination for the virus, and if a positive autopsy comes back, you do need prophylaxis. Let's summarize with some mnemonics. For rabies, I just remember that a fifth gets stiff and they're glad they're not mad. This reminds me that rabies has two forms. It's paralytic 20% of the time. Otherwise, it's encephalitic with the classic mad features. Mental state changes, autonomic dysfunction, and death. Thanks for watching Townsend Teachings. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.